welcome to this second GIJN, Global Investigative Journalism Network, webinar. Uh, and the one today is on resilience and reporting. Uh, it's going to focus on how journalists can stay healthy and sane while covering the pandemic. My name is Anne Koch, and I'm the Program Director at GIJN at the Global Investigative uh, Journalism Network, and I'll be moderating today. For those of you not familiar with GI with GIJN, we're basically the world's largest network of non-profit investigative journalism organizations. Uh, we have 182 member organizations in 77 countries, but we work with journalists everywhere, in nonprofits, in the commercial sector, and with freelancers. And we were established to connect and support journalists. So please do check our website, gijn.org, and our resource center, and sign up for our newsletters. We are also uh, recording this webinar as we have recorded the first one and hope to continue doing so. So you can check out these uh, special webinars that we're doing on COVID-19. I'm delighted today uh, to, that, to introduce two very experienced journalists that are joining us for the next hour and a quarter or so. And they're going to share their insights into the awareness that journalists need for their own mental well-being and also to support their families and colleagues and to do a better job actually of reporting. Uh, and they're going to offer their, their thoughts and, and quite practical tips to meet these challenges. Both speakers um, bring extensive experience uh, with journalists dealing with trauma. The first one, Bruce Shapiro, is the executive director of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma at Columbia University in New York. And he's also a GIJN board member. Colombian journalist Maria Teresa Ronderos is the director of the Latin America Center for Investigative Journalism and uh, in a range of positions has worked to, prote to protect the lives of journalists in danger. So we want to hear from all of you out there who have joined us in this webinar today and um, a few logistics before we start. Um, it's going to be about 75 minutes long and our two speakers will kick off a conversation, we hope. They'll speak for maybe 20 minutes or so. And then we'll take questions and comments. And you can send your uh, written questions and comments to the Q&A box, uh, which you see at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try and take on board as many as we can. Um, uh, a colleague of mine, Eunice Au, will help us to uh, read out the questions uh, so everyone can hear them. Uh, and as I said earlier, just we want you to know that we're recording this. So. Without further ado, Bruce, can you kick us off? Thank you very much, Bruce, from the um, DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here, especially with my friend, Maria Teresa, but also with all of you uh, to have what I think is gonna be a rich conversation about how we stay effective, how we stay sane during this um, unprecedented situation. Um, and I should, you know, I should say that while few of us on this call have dealt with a pandemic before, though there may be some colleagues from places like Africa that have, um, as a community of investigative journalists, we are well equipped to um, play an important role now and also, you know, well equipped to handle it. There's a lot of experience on this call, um, and I hope we can draw on it. People uh, like Maria Teresa, who have worked through long, protracted periods of uncertainty and crisis, um, periods of threat and stress to all of us. Um, let me just, I'm going to start out by saying a few things that I've learned from some of the mental health professionals who work with the DART Center and from uh, colleagues in conversations over the last month or so about the nature of resilience. And thank you. We do have uh, this web page that you're seeing that's a constantly changing list of resources for journalists at www.dartcenter.org. Um, we also are having an ongoing series of conversations that address these issues in, in greater depth. Let me start with a piece of very good news. Um, all of the research that has been done on journalists in the last 20 years, and there's actually a fair amount of it, journalists who face threat and trauma and deal with with protracted crisis around the world, says that we are a resilient tribe. Um, we are very good at coping. Our work is protective. 
having a sense of mission and purpose is protective. Having collegial relationships is protective. Having an ethical code is protective. All of those characteristics of journalism in general um, really are sources of coping, sources of flexibility, sources of strength in the face of threats. We also have some vulnerabilities. As a profession, um, we all, no matter what country we're in or what beats we are, we all deal with large amounts of human distress. Um, as young reporters, we go out and cover car wrecks and crimes and all, all kinds of mayhem. Some of us live in constant crisis zones. Some go to areas of conflict or as investigative reporters, we interact empathetically with individuals and communities that have dealt with great abuse and great suffering. Or we immerse ourselves in images or immerse ourselves in documents that carry a heavy trauma load. And, you know, that's part of the job, but all of that can be challenging and affect us. What my psychologist friends are saying about this pandemic and about the situation of journalists here is that um, there are a couple of distinct challenges that we're facing that are a little bit different from the day to day. The main one has to do with stress. As journalists, we all ride that kind of surf wave of stress. We need stress, we need deadlines, we need new constantly changing stories. Um, but we also know that at some point you ride that surfboard and then it's, if you're not careful, you kind of fall off, you crash, and you need to rest. We all need recovery time. The challenge for journalists in this period is that it's gonna be a period, some months of unrelenting combined stresses and anxiety. There's the general stress and anxiety that as human beings we all feel right now um, of not knowing how this story ends, of wondering about people we love, uh, about wondering about our communities, wondering about our own lives. There are family stresses and household stresses that are unique to this uh, physical distancing era where we're all closed in in our, in our homes, uh, working from home, living from home. Um, there are psychological stresses that come with isolation. So the question becomes how we, if it, the brain needs recovery time from all of these combined stresses. And we need to get proactive about planning for that, planning our days so that we're building in self-care time and have a self-care plan. And I can talk a little more about the elements of that later if we want. Building in time so we get exercise or yoga or meditation or anything that lowers our biological arousal, helps our brain have a period of calm. Protecting us from devices from the constant flow of technology. So that again, our, this is a, neuro, a neuroscience thing, our brains can have a period of calm and recovery during the day. Protecting our social boundaries so we can maintain community and yet also have some quiet. Um, those things are gonna be really challenging. It's also gonna be really important to maintain a sense of, and investigative journalists are good at this, a sense of mission and strategy and ethics. All of those things are a way of pushing back against what to a lot of us is gonna be experienced as the failure of our societies to protect us in a time of pandemic. And it, it, there's a lot of good evidence that says that people who do well in, in the face of, uh, in, in the face of protracted stress, are people with a strong sense of moral purpose, a strong sense of um, ethics. And finally, and most important, is collegial support. All the research that's been done on journalists uh, in all kinds of crises says that the single factor most associated with issues like PTSD or other problems like that is social isolation. And the single most important resilience factor, the things that gives us some flexibility and recovery time, um, is 
peer support and other kinds of social connection. Through this pandemic, as investigative journalists, we're going to need to be especially planful around that. Um, many of us are lucky enough to work in collaborative teams, but we also tend to be a group who burrows into projects and kind of uh, kind, kind of excludes the world and just kind of goes. I know certainly that is my practice. We need to very deliberately plan for that kind of social connection and collegial connection, whether it's through webinars like this or through planning small conversations with colleagues. Um, there's a lot more to say, but that's the key th message I just would ask you to take away actually is this. We've, we've talked a lot internationally about flattening the curve of the pandemic, but we as journalists need to also think about flattening the stress curve. That's going to be the characteristic challenge of this period. We don't want that peak and crash. That will be very hard to handle. What instead we want to do are find activities that moderate the stress curve, that flatten that curve by maintaining professionalism, maintaining boundaries, having a self-care plan, taking care of collegial support. Great. Thank you very much, Maria Teresa. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Bruce, and Eunice, and Marta, and everybody who made this possible. It's really a pleasure to be here, uh, even though the circumstances are difficult. Uh, I think Bruce said everything I wanted to say, so I don't need to say anything now. <laughs> um, I just want to stress two points he made. I think you have, like, I always think about it like three dimensions of what, what you, how, how you can be resilient. One is the personal care, which Bruce knows more and has talked and given you some tips about it. And we, we can, of course, he can ask many other questions related to that. And then you have the dealing with your colleagues and with the sources. Both things are always something that you have to think about. How do you deal with sources at this point? How do you treat them in a way that you also understand their stress, their, their, their anxiety, the pressure they have, the social pressure, especially when you're talking to medical doctors, to, to government officials, to people who are actually in the middle of the pandemic, trying to deal with it directly. And of course, you have to do your work as an investigative reporter, so you have to ask the tough questions. So think about how do you ask those questions? How do you balance also your feed to the public so that it's not all like we're always the ones who bring the bad news. So how can we also tell stories that show good practice, that show how people are doing it well? Yeah. So yeah. transparent governments that are actually putting out their really, really good information or really transparent information. So you can also think that you're somehow constructing the world right now. You're also protecting. And of course, you have to do your work and keep government to account. So you can also do that and you have to do that. But how do you do it in a way that, that it, you've, it feels constructive, not just to yourself and your colleagues, but also to the world, that you, people are not very, they're not tolerating a lot of criticism. So how do you do it in a way that you say, okay, guys, if we know more who's infected and where they are infected, and we have, maybe there's a better way to quarantine people rather than completely bankrupt the economy or something like that. So they're looking for ways, listening to solutions a lot. So that's the other thing. Now, the, the last, uh, but not least, way to deal with, with resilience or to build up your resilience has to do with how you deal also with the world. And I have, two, I have three tips for that. Uh, one that, the, uh, that Bruce already um, dealt with, uh, and I want to stress it, which is focus, focus, focus. With this avalanche of information, probably every one of us is reading a ton of newspaper articles, stories, WhatsApp streams of information, everybody sharing, 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 and you, you go crazy. You don't know what you're doing as a journalist. If you to cover COVID right now, you need to have focus. You need to know what you're covering, what you can do and what you cannot do, and just let it go. 
and, and really have good focus. And the other thing is talk a lot with your colleagues and your editors if you have editors still, if they're, if they're not, they, if everybody has not been fired yet. But if you don't, talk a lot with your colleagues. Ask them, how do you do this? How do you find this information? Because this will help you keep that focus and that purpose. I think we are very privileged because unlike a lot of people like around my family or my friends, they feel impotent. They feel they cannot do anything about this humongous thing. And at least we get to do things as journalists. We are actually saying, and that feels so much better. I mean, the day we made a, we built a team together to start doing the investigative work in Latin America, we felt, I felt like half of my stress was gone because I felt that I yep. was doing something about it. It was just not like sitting there and feeling, whoops. Now my other question, my other point that how to deal with the world and with the journalism has to do with collaboration. Collaboration, not just talking and sharing with friends and asking people about how to keep your focus, but to also collaborate in the work. I think the pandemic shows that we need a lot of collaboration. And our instinct that as journalists, most of our instinct is competition. We need to win, we need to have a scoop, we need to have a better story than our competition. And I think this is not, I mean, I think more and more in the internet era, that's less the case. We need to collaborate and collaborate and collaborate. And, um, and I think at this point, I think we should collaborate more and more. And if there are four or five networks of investigative journalists in your region working in different projects, that's fantastic. The more, the, the better. Um, I think there's too much information that we need to check on. And so we need a lot of teams because most of this information has all kinds of international ties. And we're gonna feel better too if we collaborate. We feel we're not alone. We're, we feel a sense of power which is a, a really good sense at this, at this point in time. I just now want the, to jump, oh, sorry, uh, go ahead. No, my, 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 my last point, which I think a lot of you are facing, you had long investigative stories that you've already worked for months before the, the virus, and then your editors or yourselves, you're saying, why should I publish this? Why should I continue this? Why should I finish this story? Let's. Let's drop it because we have to drop everything and go to the pandemia and do everything. And I think that that's the wrong attitude. I would recommend, and I'm fighting very hard within my own network, to keep people on deadlines. Finish your stories. If you had a big story, finish that story and have it ready. And whenever you see a, 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 a space, a window of opportunity, publish it. People need all kinds of information and they have lots of time today to read. And so it's not just pandemic. So if you have a great story and you haven't published it for, for weeks now because you're waiting for the right moment, I think you should think about maybe also collaborating with less stress in the world by telling people about other stories that matter and that care and life everyday life and everyday holding governments to account still matters. And that gives people a sense of the world will continue. And I think that's good that you keep publishing those stories. Even if they don't have a huge impact today, they might have a huge impact in a month or two or three, or you don't even know how much it will actually pay. People will pay more attention to it because they have more time and they want sometimes to get off this news about the virus. So that's my other big recommendation at the moment. Fight for your stories, your old stories. Try to finish them as much as you can and try to publish them. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bruce, did you want to respond to any of the points there? I think there was a lot of, I think if we took both your tips, both sets of tips, we'd have an extremely useful, uh, I, I feel a really useful set of advice for people trying to work, uh, journalists that are trying to work at the moment. Well, you know, everything yeah. from the, the personal um, and the form that you need to the collaboration and the collaboration also having a dual function of doing the work 
of course, but also of having solidarity and, and, and social communication and so on. You were about I mean, to say something. Yeah, well, well, everything Maria Teresa and I said are kind of in harmony with one another. It was, it was really nice. I would just say that embedded in this, I want to pick up on one thing that she said, which is key to both our professional success through this period with high impact reporting and our psychological coping is our ability to gain some control over s small elements of this overwhelming um, global crisis by doing our work and by planning. The, the one thing that of all kinds of reporters, investigative reporters are best at, planning and strategizing. Um, I was on a, on a similar webinar, a DART webinar yesterday with Aaron Glantz, a reporter from Reveal in the US, um, who was talking about, he's both looking at the kind of breaking news phase, what do I need to cover now, but what what is gonna be changed in two months and what therefore is worth investigating in light of what is likely to change. He's thinking about his sources his existing sources on his existing beats saying, what's changed for them? And therefore, why are they gonna talk to me? All of that is a way of gaining some control. Um, and you know, when stuff gets overwhelming, one of the things that can really help is a very simple strategy, which is making lists. Here's what I can control, here's what I can't control, and focus, whether it's professionally or in your home life, on the things you can control. This is also a time when things like work journals or lists at the end of the day of everybody who you called and what you're gonna to do tomorrow, all those kinds of strategies, which are kind of you know, corny time management strategies, actually are really helpful in this, tightening up that kind of stuff is really helpful in this crisis because so much is out of our control. So for example, I am, I am absolutely terrible about keeping my calendar in order and I do a lot of meetings on the fly and stuff like that. I, I've really gotten much more uh, rigorous about scheduling my time of putting it on the calendar that my colleagues at the Dart Center see of being more planful because I know I need it, right? Uh, and it's not something I'm naturally good at. It's taking a little bit of, of planning. Um, to which, so I, I would add one more thing, which is to know your own signature strengths, both as a journalist and as a person, and areas in which you know are things you're not so great at, or areas that are actual vulnerabilities. If you're a person who has um, dealt with a lot with physical illness and has immune compromise of some sort or other physical vulnerabilities at this time, if you're a person who's dealt with mental health issues, if you're a person who just has bad habits, bad habits all are going to come out during this period of protracted stress. So whatever it is that's worked for you at, at, in the past, you want to think about that a little bit and marshal those resources now in a planful way. And that applies both to your reporting and to the personal stuff. Uh, speaking of resources, um, we're about to post, we've put together, one of my colleagues has put together a very good resource list on this particular topic of trauma and resilience and is going to be, we'll post it now in the uh, chat box. So for, for everyone out there watching um, or listening, we're, we're coming yeah. to you soon. Go, sorry, Maria, did you? No, no, no. I was you can see it. Yeah. Pointing some of the questions that people are making and. Oh, I go was, ahead. Do you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of, one, one has to do with how do you deal with your families and especially families mm, that are- Good question. Going out, you're going to, so Rowan Philip is asking if you go out to hospitals and you're covering and you're out, mm -hmm. then your family becomes really afraid that, yeah. uh, that you're going to contaminate them and that could be a really big source of stress. And also, even if you, if you are divorced and your children are with your spouse, then it becomes really difficult because then there's even more stress about it. Um, one of the things that I think should be really helpful is to, to explain, first of all, to use all the recommendations that everybody's websites have about how you cover yourself, how you protect yourself, 
how do you go and do this reporting without putting anybody else in danger? The other thing is to make it, to share those resources with your own family so that they are, they are clear that you're not just a crazy lunatic who's out there contaminating everybody or bringing their illness home, but that you're actually following guidelines of very knowledgeable people who have yeah. uh, drafted these guidelines, you know, from the WHO to CPJ to all, there's all kinds of resources out there that I JJ and is putting a lot of them up. Um, and if you show this to your family and show them that there are methods that yeah. you can protect yourself and you can keep a family life, then probably anxiety and, and, and stress is going to go up. Down. Yeah. I mean, and let, let me add a couple things to that. First of all, let's be honest here. Um, social interaction and on-scene in-person reporting it does have some risks associated with it now, right? And they're both um, personal risks to our own safety through exposure to people who are sick, but also an ethical challenge. We don't want to become a part of the spreading problem, right? We don't want people to say, oh, journalists are just running around spreading the virus. So on whether it's for your families or for yourself, I think it is also important to develop some standards, to have a, a, a kind of an assessment for when it's actually important to be reporting in the field and when you can report in a more distanced way. Make sure that, the, that you're minimizing risk. We can't eliminate risk, but you wanna minimize it by doing field reporting that you've really thought about that you know is it's got to be done. It's essential. And then minimizing risk by doing, by as Maria Teresa said, following all of the very best practice guidelines for um, protecting yourself from exposure to water droplets and so on. You know, you might also ask um, in your own community what medical professionals are doing and how they're handling it with their families. My uh, son-in-law is a doctor and he is near a, a big hospital in Ireland and he changes, he not only puts on all the PPE, the personal protective equipment with his patients, but um, A, he changes his clothes at the end of his shift at the hospital, so changes out of his stuff instead of wearing the work clothes home. He puts the work clothes in a plastic bag that goes straight into the wash as soon as he gets home. Um, some doctors and reporters I know are changing in the hallway outside of their houses, their apartments before they go in. Um, my daughter and, and her husband also have, because of his medical exposure, um, a plan for how to handle it if one of them gets sick. And they also have a uh, heightened uh, household hygiene plan where they have bleach and they're wiping doorknobs down every day. They're just like doing a lot of stuff because of the extra risk brought by my son-in-law's work as a doctor. If we are journalists in the field, I do think you know, we need to be engaging our families in this best practice conversation. It's not going to be easy and it's not going to prevent struggle. But I will say that, that part of the DART Center's work with journalists who cover traumatic events in the past has taught us that sometimes sometimes bringing families in, bringing partners in and giving them a sense of, of control and authority and understanding how we make decisions, who our colleagues are, all of that, that can be helpful at a time like this. Sometimes, it's not religion. Sometimes it's going to be tough. Yes, I mean, it's, um, so there's everything in this resilience issue from the physical to the emotional and mental. There's the individual you and how you deal with yourself. And then there's your colleagues, your family, and then there's the work, there's collaboration, there's safety at work, there's uh, the stories that don't relate to this, there's your relationship to this story in particular and how you can most usefully do things. And then the time management, which is very tricky, uh, both at home where you're not constantly looking at your phone or whatever, to basically figuring out how you can get some downtime, even though people are, are very, very distracted, very anxious have and have an unsure future. So I wanna go, just before we go to the questions, I just wanna to go to two ends of that. Uh, first to you, Bruce, on the, uh, on the personal plan that you talked about, a little bit more in detail. So as an individual, of course, I shouldn't look at my phone all night, or but can you just, <laughs> 
<laughs> give us a few tips about that anxiety um, that, that people are really feeling as journalists and as human beings. That's one thing. Sure. Then we'll go to Maria. And I, I, I'd love, Maria Teresa, I would love to hear a little bit more about how you think we can start to collaborate a bit more. Um, can we, for example, at GIJN help in any way, I don't know, to help put people in connection with each other? Uh, at the moment, for example, we have um, an initiative that we're going to be uh, launching in a couple of weeks, well, actually, sorry, next week, about putting filmmakers, people making films about the coronavirus, in touch with each other. Mm -hmm. So are there other things that we might be able to do for that, co that very positive collaborative um, dimension that you, you spoke about? Anyway, Bruce, first, please, on the more well, personal. Self-care self plan, sure. Well, yeah. so look, what, what does a journalist self-care plan looks like? I mean, it, you know, it looks like having three drinks at night instead of one, <laughs> five, right? Um, but um, I, I think actually realistically, we do need to be both planful and realistic during this period. Um, there is actually on the Dart Center website, a, a self-care inventory, a, a kind of guide to walk yourself through this stuff. Um, and we can send around that link afterwards. Um, I'll, I'll track it down. But I think there, there are kind of a few key elements to self-care for journalists that we need to be thinking about. One is physical. Um, you want to be protect, you, you want to be um, lowering your, your physiological arousal and maintaining some fitness, especially kind of aerobic breathing kinds of stuff. So again, how am I going to get exercise? Am I a lapsed yoga person? Is this a time to pick it up again? Um, you know, what's, what's one thing I can do to maintain a little bit of physical fitness? What can I do to protect my boundaries better? And that's a crucial one. There's human boundaries. How do I work at home when my family is screaming? What kinds of plan can my family and I make to do this? What, um, when am I on work? When am I off work? There's technological. Um, I've become a very big fan of planning points in the day that are device free. We, you know, as human beings, we all depend on our devices and as journalists, we depend on them more, more than most people our brains need neurological recovery time. So we want to have an hour before bedtime that's device free where we're reading dead tree books and publications or, <laughs> or we're playing music or doing something. Um, you be, want to be off your devices at that point. You may want to start the day. I, na I now have a kind of mostly kept promise to myself that for the first hour that I'm up, I'm not going to look at my phone, not going to get on email, going to let my head do what it does in the morning. Um, we need these kind of boundaries um, in a central way. What are we doing socially? What's our plan for staying in touch with a few key people? Are we planning those online cocktail hours? Are we planning meetings with colleagues? And finally, what are we doing, some people would say spiritually, some people would say artistically, but what are we doing for that kind of bigger self that's not either just the journalist or the person who's trying to keep his bathroom clean, what are we doing to connect us to a broader sense of imagination possibility? And I, I liked what Maria Teresa said earlier about imagining the future, right? We need that. And finally, it's important that in each of these areas, um, we be setting goals that are realistic. This is not time for um, the kind of New Year's resolution that you're gonna like, lose 50 pounds, emerge looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and solve all of your, your marital problems, um, the, which Arnold Schwarzenegger clearly did not. But uh, you know, this is a time for attainable victories. What's one thing I can do differently in my professional practice? What's one thing I can add this week to my sort of um, personal self-care plan? What's one thing I can do to maintain my connections with friends or colleagues through this period? Attainable victories. They're the key to control and they're key to imagining the future. So, and I, uh, regarding your idea about collaboration, I was, I, there are, there are a number of communities have risen because of the coronavirus. There's the, uh, Mark Abra, it was now mentioning the ONA, the online, uh, what is it, 
National Association, uh, launched an initiative to create communities to share and talk with the, with the journalists. But you have the International Center for Journalists have also uh, created communities and forums and experts and not only mm -hmm. to get to know and to do reporting, but also to share and to, and to connect. There's also the Fundación Gabo is creating a series of panels, webinars like these ones to, to, to connect with journalists, to, to know what's happening with them. And I think going to some of these conferences yeah. is part of the schedule that Bruce was talking about. Like, yeah. okay, let's see what's on this week. Like when you're living in a normal life and you go to a conference in a, in a library or in a, in a place, you also can plan your conferences and your webinars and your things. So that's, that's something that you can do. But I think there is a big stress right now, if maybe some of you will know exactly what I mean. Uh, I used to have editors who, if I wasn't sitting on a chair next to them and they could see me work, they would go nuts. Because they every time something happened, they wanted to yell out and, and get yep. somebody next door and somebody reacting immediately. And these editors are probably feeling terrible right now because they can't, they can't, they don't have all these people around them and they can't, and they're probably full of angst and they're putting a lot of pressure on you as a journalist and as a, as a, as a reporter to be there all the time. And, and so you have to have those talks with your editors and, and see and think and discuss how are you going to replan and go to different kinds of practicing, working on the internet and not working physically together in the same space. I think that's something super important that you do. The yeah. other thing that it's important that you have to educate your editors in a way, especially those kinds of traditional editors that were in, in, the, in the newsrooms. Um, but the editors, and I think that this was relates to another question, editors uh, need to be sort of the, the how do you say, the, 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 the guide, the, in, in many ways. So one of yeah. the things you keep their team together. Be beware that you need to keep the yeah. team together. You are the ones who people look to 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 see this focus, to see where are you going. This of course this is not all on you, but you have a bigger responsibility to keep that focus and I think that's super important. Now there was another point that I that I thought was very very interesting and I I found a lot of people with a lot of problems related to that, which is the, the freelancers. There's lots yeah. and lots of freelancers right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they had a, a way of doing things that has been completely disrupted. And a lot of them are new freelancers because a lot of people have been fired and more will be fired because of the coronavirus and the, and the quarantine and all the impact, the economic impact. So one thing that maybe J.I. Jane could do, and maybe we can all think how we can do it, is ask media outlets how they can make it easy for, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, freelance journalists to pitch stories. Is there a way that they can have, like, which editors they, are, they should uh, go to, or which one they should, uh, so at least have a little, like, information things for, 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 for pitching stories or for getting stories out there. I think that's super difficult for most, of, for most uh, freelance journalists and especially at this moment. And I think that could be something that we can devise together to see how we can respond to that kind of need. Um, that's um, a really that's, good idea. Yeah, mm. yeah. and there, then, then there's other kinds of collaborations that I know are going on. For example, finance and covered, you know, the the the, the, mm. the University of journalists in London, they're they're offering and they're offering webinars and things. How do you, how do you, and they're posting them on their website in case you you miss them. Uh, how to investigate? How to get government account? How to follow the accounts? How is this emergency kind of procurement working? How are they working? Also, the open contracting partnerships yeah. people they're also with a lot of resources uh on on how to follow the money if you cannot physically go and get the papers and the documents and because something happened or they're completely closed down or whatever no 
Yeah, very helpful. Um, actually, Open Contracting came on last week's webinar and they sent us a lot of resources afterwards. So thanks right. for that. Yeah, very, very good suggestions. I think the freelance one is, is particularly interesting and relevant, isn't it? Um, I think we're going to go to some questions now. And my colleague Eunice, who has now appeared, uh, has been looking at the questions. By the way, can I remind everyone to please enter your questions? Uh, it's not necessarily intuitive, but into the Q&A box rather than the chat box. I think we've got equal numbers in both, but we're, we're asking people please to ask the questions in the Q&A box. Eunice, Okay, over to uh, you. I've got one question from Evelyn Morris from South Africa. She's kind of worrying about her sanity, trying to be a single parent and homeschooling while trying to work at the same time and also suffering with uh, internet con connectivity problems. Do you have any advice for her? And uh, shall I do two more questions before you answer? Yeah, let's take three at once. If you, okay. um, Bruce, if you okay. take that first one. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Eunice. Uh, then there's also uh, Mark Cabra who asked about initiatives and communities to share and talk about topics concerning journalists right now about COVID-19. She's asking whether both of you know any other communities that, that you can share out there. And one more, uh, I'm sorry, these questions aren't really connected to each other, but Vopa Porn, uh, a journalist and her colleague was investigating the impact of COVID-19 at banks today, and they were talking to people at the bank, but they were chased away. So what can they do in this situation in asking, you know, convincing people to talk to them or what kind of advice do you have? Bruce, do you want to kick off with the first one, and then we can uh, sure. uh, answer whatever I, ones you want, and then we'll get yeah, well, some response. Well, well, yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll I'll start with that first one I, we, because I think while you know, I think the particular that particular situation sounds extremely challenging. A lot of folks are are wondering how to juggle homeschooling and children, and even if people aren't single parents, how how to deal with that. Um, you know. A, there's no easy answer, clearly, but I think it's an area where structure and planning are going to become even more important than ever before. Um, you know, when my own kid was very small, I got some advice from a writer friend of mine who said, who looked at me one day and said, you're going to need to go to bed at the same time she does and get up at four in the morning, because that's the only way you're going to have like three unbroken hours of, of writing time or reporting time, um, you know, it, it, um, whether that's the answer or not, it's going to take that kind of plan. I would also do an inventory and be realistic about what you can control and what you can't control. You know, if your internet is going to suck because you have lousy internet providers and more bad bandwidth, that's not in your control. So you need to just expect that it's going to be the, the condition and plan for it. Um, it's also a place, though, where you're turning to colleagues, whether it's other colleagues who are single parents and problem solving through this together, or turning to mentors and family members and saying, I want to talk this through with you. Um, it's a place where getting help from others is going to be important both to the practical advice you get and to giving you a sense of not being in this alone. And I, you know, I'm sorry if I can't offer any better advice. I don't want to sugarcoat it. This is not easy. It's for a single parent right now who's a journalist, it's going to be really challenging. Okay. Thanks for that, Bruce. Did you want to add anything, Maria Teresa, or uh, address oh, I, the second I, and third question? Yeah, let's go to the other questions. I think was completely okay. Answered. The second one was about uh, initiatives around community reporting mm -hmm. on the on the pandemic. Um, yeah, that was, and then yeah, the other one was the last one was about being chased away, being uh, rebuffed from telling a story about the virus by a bank, I believe, from Cambodia. So I think I think the one that. Uh, Mar presented, I think we had already sort of gone out over it about uh, the kinds of communities for talking to journalists to how can you connect to other journalists, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I think we, we went over that a little bit. Uh, the one re related to, to being rejected, 
I think there is a lot of that going on, and there's a, some stories coming out uh, uh, recently about how information is being closed down and, and how the emergency is being used as an excuse for, for, for closing governments, for, for going, uh, for, for going uh, on a dictatorship kind of trend. Uh, there's been some stories about it. I think that if that happens, I think you should report on it and make it public and, and talk with other people and maybe this is a source of a good story for collaboration. What are, what is the information we're getting? What information we're not getting? And let the public know that they're not getting all the information if they are not. And think about what information is really vital for your country at this point in time, whether it's social impact, whether it has to do with the actual spread of the virus or whatever. And I think that's something that you, not just make it a personal issue, or they didn't let me into the bank, but try and say, okay, who's, who's, who's limiting the ability to know what's happening? And try to question and push back on that. Because I think if there's no freedom, there's no journalism, and we need this moment to push back and not let governments use this as an excuse or other banks or whatever, to say, okay, we close down, we don't give information, we are in an emergency. I think, on the contrary, we need to keep pushing for transparency. And one way to do it is to, you know, go out, to use the internet, ask if everybody else in your country has had that kind of experience of being pushed out. And then you can build a story from, from social networks, or you can build a story yes. from whatever your colleagues tell you by reporting. Um, but I think you, you have to push back on that when, and not just feel completely, you know, okay, I can't do my work because then it would be very frustrating. And I think resiliency is about always feeling that you can do it and that you, you have a limited ability, as Bruce pointed out before, you're not going to be able to do everything you focus, but then if something really hurts you, try to do something about it and then look for colleagues to help you to do it. Yeah. Let me just add a couple quick things to that. I, I, I think, uh, first of all, to piggyback on Maria Teresa, I was talking to a public health uh, specialist just yesterday who was saying to me that there's not enough appreciation that the right to information is a central public health matter, that central to the public's ability to be safe and to deal with this pandemic is access to accurate information about what's happening. And we play a part in that. The rights of journalists are actually, in this case, a public health matter. It's not just our own sort of selfish professional interest. Um, in both cases, in a very practical way, both for community, this question of journalistic communities and the question of what to do about being chased away with the bank, I would say turn in particular to social media and in particular to Facebook. Um, Facebook is the big Satan in a lot of ways, but in this crisis, um, there, on the journalism community side, there are a number of Facebook groups, some of them closed, requiring you to request um, an invitation, um, that are for communities dealing, journalism communities dealing in one way or another uh, with this crisis. There's a whole Facebook group of, of videographers and camera operators in which people are sharing tips, are problem solving, are talking about what's getting them down. There's a group called Journalists Covering Trauma, which is um, a US-based Facebook group that has reporters, 500 or so reporters from all over the world, just kind of talking to each other about what's tough. There are, uh, there's the Vulture Club, which is for foreign correspondents, crisis correspondents who are trying to figure out how to handle conflict areas. There, figure out what the different Facebook groups like that are. And similarly, um, if you're being chased away from a bank, um, use Facebook to find people who have posted their employment and contact them um, independently through Facebook Messenger or whatever. One of the things that I've heard now from multiple reporters is that people sources, while there's a clampdown of information, 
as individuals, people are more anxious to be sources, more willing to mm -hmm. talk to reporters than ever before, because they're all dealing, our sources are, are all dealing with the same fear, the same anxiety, the same frustrations. And the bank may chase you away, but if you email some bank teller, you Facebook message or some bank teller at home, they may be willing to share with you. So, you know, there's a lot of good reporting being done actually about how workplaces are being irresponsible or dealing well with coronavirus and they rely on that kind of sourcing, okay? Good points, very good. Eunice, some more questions? Hi, yes. Uh, I know the speakers have touched a bit on freelancers just now, uh, but there are a bunch of questions related to freelancers that I would like to bring up. Sonia Sarka from India, she said the biggest stress is not being able to reach out to the right editor of the right website for the pitching because most features are time sensitive and it kind of wastes time to look for that. Is there a resource pool on you know, editors who would uh, love to be contacted uh, and look, looking for COVID-19 stories? Um, Raga Vendra Prasad, uh, as an independent investigative journalist, uh, many of the editors who were earlier very welcoming is now reluctant to get stories from freelancers and rather prefer stories from permanent staff. So any advice for journalists to tackle this situation? Cristina Costa from Portugal says she cannot even leave the house without a work contract and they are not even allowed to drive. So there's uh, strict restrictions of movement. And uh, I think I'm going to squeeze in one last one. Jumana Al-Tamimi, is it even a good idea to suggest stories for editors that are not related to COVID-19 at this time or not? Can I, can I take that last couple of them? Good um, questions. Yeah, I, I think pitching non-COVID-19 stories right now is a really good strategy. First of all, as Maria Teresa said, people need to be reading or listening or seeing other stuff. I don't know about you, but you know, at nine o'clock at night, the last thing I want to see is another coronavirus story on television. I'm watching other stuff, right? Um, and smart editors know that. Smart editors also are looking two and three and six months ahead and are, you know, are planning for when people are exhausted by coronavirus stories or when the pandemic is over. Um, so I think there's every reason to pitch in terms of not leaving, being able to leave the house without a contract and all that, I, that gets to a much broader point, which is that I think we, we need to be innovators in distanced reporting and learn from one another. There already are some existing resources that I think GIJN and some other groups have posted on techniques and strategies for distanced reporting. But, you know, it's you, it's you folks. It's this generation of journalists who are going to be the great innovators in reporting when you can't leave the house. How do you report when you can't leave the house? There's still ways to do it. Some we know, like data reporting, but there's a lot of other clever stuff. So, you know, be an innovator. And that, in turn, gets to me to these other questions about finding an editor and all that sort of thing. This is where freelancers have to be talking to freelancers. You have to be creating closed Facebook groups or listservs or other ways where people can be sharing experiences, sharing information, um, becoming good colleagues to each other. Um, I point you also to one group in London. There's an organization called the Rory Peck Trust, which provides a variety of resources to freelancers, primarily around safety, but they also have a freelance emergency fund for people who have uh, lost their employment as a result of COVID-19. Um, so, you know, um, there are those kind of resources as well. Yeah, we can try at GIGN to do some, we'll try and put together some resources for freelancers. We have some already, but particularly um, COVID uh, related. Maria Teresa, suggestions? Yes, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to make a point about about uh, the the reporting without being able to go out. Mm. I think you have to push again, try and reach your local press organization or anything that they will let you go out without without having to have a contract because you are part of the of the basic emergency team. People need information. People need to know what's happening. 
So that's one thing. So if you're really being restricted, try and tell that to CPJ, try and tell yeah. that to Reporters from Frontier, try and, and make it public. And that's one point. But the other point, which is more practical, is use this time to learn much more about open source investigative reporting. Uh, you know, Bellingcat, you know, some others who are really good at this. And so I've been learning a lot about how to do reporting using online resources and using the social networks, even reporting with, with, with ordinary people, which is the, the part that you, you feel you can't do. A lot of people are putting their complaints out there with the system, are putting out all kinds of, you know, ex, even little, you know, com complaints about purchases, government purchases that are going bad. Go, follow those leads, talk to these people, uh, follow, uh, send private messages for Twitter or use the Facebook or whatever, whatever. I think there's a lot of ways that you can actually do open source reporting at this point. And it's, if you don't know, it's a really good moment to learn and it's going to be much better. You can physically go to places through use your satellite. You can see what, what is happening in front of a building, in a hospital, in your town. You can use a lot of these resources. A lot of them are posted in Bellingcat's website that I know of, but there's others, of course, Jajen also has a lot of resources for open source investigation. So I think this is the moment to make that jump. And I think uh, you're going to find that uh, you can do a lot of, you're going to be amazed at how much reporting you can do without. I mean, a lot of us that come from dangerous countries, like many of the colleagues in, 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 in the world, we couldn't go to places and we had to learn to do reporting without going to places. Because if you went to a place, you would highly probably get killed. So you have to know how do you report on a place that you cannot go to. And uh, that's the way you, 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 you try to, to develop new channels. So think about those places that you cannot go, that you've always have not been able to go, and think of this virus as those places, and then try to find the information like you did before when you couldn't go to a place that was too dangerous to go. It's interesting because we haven't announced it yet, but we're planning a, a webinar on using open source from behind your desk, if you like. And some of the people you mentioned will, we hope will speak. So to everyone out there who's interested in working this way, um, I hope we have some more. It's actually not on the sheet. We've just formed, uh, shown you now because it's still in the works, but possibly the, uh, the last week of April. And so keep an eye on our website and you'll see it go up probably next week. Um, yeah, thanks. That's really good. Good comments, and we think I think we can take some more questions now, Eunice. If you have some okay. there for us, I guess this is more about the stress part of it. Suzanne Reber asked Bruce, "Can you talk more about why the ongoing peaks of stress are so harmful to the body? Uh, maybe talk about the physiological basis of that. It might help people understand better why rest is so important." And then Betty Johnson Gayo asked Bruce as well. Uh, Bruce spoke of the source of strength while well, West Africa has had Ebola, what traumatic stress issues should journalists be expecting to handle? Mm. And Gabriel Bermudez is asking Maria Teresa, how to manage the big differences in many countries' uh, ways of combating the pandemic? How can we choose good examples to maintain the hope? And maybe one last question. Uh, someone asked, how can we manage our kids' mental health during this pandemic time as well? Because they are stuck at home with us and highly exposed to all the news of COVID-19 in our journalist work. Yeah. Oh, those are such good questions, Bruce. The first two were for you. Sure. The first one on the uh, physiological basis of stress. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think... I don't want to take a whole lot of time for like a neuroscience talk here, but there's a a lot of evidence that when the when we're under threat our brain and body mobilize to protect us so if you're out there in the street and you're nearly hit by a car your system mobilizes right your heart starts to beat a little bit faster the the frontal lobes of your brain that are what make you a smart journalist all go offline and your brain just says get the fuck out of the way and uh and and then you sort of calm down a little bit 
but you know, if threat is severe or if threat is protracted, the body remains in this kind of aroused state. And when the body is in a highly aroused state, we also consolidate that sense of threat. The memory stays closer to the surface. Fear stays closer to the surface. Um, our people can be changed psychologically, which you know, brings us into trauma science and, and all that. Um, when I talk about kind of moderating your arousal, what you're trying to do is um, make it easier for the brain to kind of wake up and say, oh, okay, I'm actually, I'm safe for now. I don't need to have my threat alarm on all the time. I don't need to be anxious all the time. The smart part of my brain can think and strategize. I don't need to be in fight or flight mode. Fight or flight mode changes your body chemistry as does kind of ongoing th general stress. One of the unique features of this pandemic is that you've got both together. We've got stress combined with a pervasive sense of anxiety and threat that's physically exhausting and interferes with the brain's ability to get perspective on things and make good judgments. Um, look, a lot of us as journalists have been in a situation where we experienced a lot of burnout or where we made bad news judgments because we were too tired or too angry or too, um, or not talking to the right colleagues. What we're trying to do when we talk about managing stress as journalists in this very practical nuts and bolts way is keeping our news judgment sound keeping our boundaries sound and trying to be kind of good colleagues and neighbors. Um, psychological injury is when people are changed as a result of their work and things that you used to be good at like deadline, you're no longer so good at, or people who are, have been easy to get along with become hard to get along with. Um, we're trying to protect ourselves from that, not just to be kind to ourselves, but because those skills are central to our mission as journalists. If we believe that journalism is important through this pandemic, whether it's reporting on the pandemic or other things, then we have to believe that it's important to keep ourselves in shape to do it. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It's, it's kind of as simple as that. Um, and you know, and that's, I, I want to say one other thing. A lot of the clinicians I talk to are less worried about post-traumatic stress in this global crisis, which, which is about experiencing directly or vicariously threat and horror and, and death and all that, and much more worried about burnout, much more worried about depression, much more worried about us just, just kind of eroding in our capacity under the weight of our combined journalistic pressures and personal pressures. So we're trying, we're trying to attend to that. You want to take the second question because I know you have thought of and worked on Ebola, uh, which was, uh, uh, there was a question from West Africa about that. And um, yeah, Are you, did you catch the question? Y yeah, Eunice, could you repeat the Ebola question? Uh, he's basically asking what traumatic stress issues should journalists oh. be expecting. Yeah. yeah, right. So, right. And that, so, so in a sense, I was saying we're actually maybe a little more worried about, about the depression, about depression and burnout in this particular crisis. That said, if you are dealing with a steady diet of toxic imagery, or if you're interviewing lots and lots and lots of people about loss, that can get in your head right? And while the research shows that journalists are, on the whole, really good at handling this and resilient, when a pervasive sense of threat and toxic imagery do take over, um, do kind of take over our lives, it interferes with exactly the mechanisms that make us good as journalists. Memory, um, empathetic connection with people, all that sort of stuff. So without going into a big PTSD lecture, um, I would say look on the Dart Center website. There are tip sheets on dealing with things like graphic imagery, online abuse, 
taking care of yourself during high trauma exposure assignments, um, that you want to you want to follow that kind of advice because you are going to be dealing with a lot of haunting or emotionally confronting um, images, voices, and information right now. Okay, thank you. Maria Teresa, the question about the how you can learn from other countries for good practice, best results. I mean, you made the point uh, when you first spoke about things that can actually help you to become more resilient, which is to see what other countries are doing and to use those examples where they were positive or negative, actually. But in your case, you said positive to, uh, you know, to be, to be able to report your own country uh, or your own location uh, more effectively. Sorry, you've got your um, you've got your sound off, Maria. Sure. I Thank wanted you. to connect with the, also with what Bruce was saying. Sure, please um, pick up on that. Yeah, in, in terms of long-term exposure to pain, to suffering, a lot mm. of us have been exposed for long, long terms in countries where there has been conflict and war and things for a long term. We've all been very exposed to that for a long term. And, and one of my own experiences, but also with colleagues, uh, is that if you, one of the things that will help you cope better if, is if you understand, if you understand what's happening. And then if you really understand it in a deep way, you can explain it to others. And if you explain to others, you help others make more sense of their own lives and their own moments and what is happening and how they can be resilient too. So this connects with the question and regarding comparison to other countries. So if you only look at your own country, you never understand really quite how this works. So let's, let's talk about, for example, the possibility of having a vaccine or having a, a, a miracle remedy, or how do you say it? Uh, so vaccine. <laughs> yeah. Not, not yeah. the vaccine, but the one that will cure you, you know, that will, yeah. I yeah. don't know. Sorry, yes, I understand, yeah. I, I don't know the term. Ter, 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 a remedy. The remedy. So, so how do you... How do you understand and explain to people what is really going on behind the vaccine? You have to really understand it to be able to explain it to people. And maybe you can start to see good examples of some countries that are developing the vaccine in a, in a, in a sound way and how they're doing it. And some countries in which there's a, a nightmarish sort of fight between big pharmaceuticals trying to get out the vaccine and who owns it. And, and, and then you can compare and contrast and explain people so they'll have a context to understand the decisions of their own government. I think, and this has to do with resilience because if you really understand, you feel better. And if you explain to others uh, how things work, then you're going to help them feel better too. Uh, in terms of is the government making good decisions? You can only know that if you compare it to others. How, how do other governments have made decisions? And there's some resources that are starting to compare different countries. Mm. I saw a story on Politico saying, okay, how many days after the pandemic, blah, blah, blah. But then there are other ways, there are other kinds of stories. For example, are there any new technologies being developed in this country because of the, of the pandemic? Or are there responses by, you know, uh, governments and or private companies? I, I one day, one about three days ago, I read a story on Vanity Fair about uh, a group of engineers and medical doctors in Colombia in Medellin that came up with this amazing design for a ventilator that they're gonna sell. They hope if things go well for a thousand dollars and. It just made my day. It was a really well-researched piece with a lot of uh, sources. And I think it gives you hope. It gives you something to look forward to. But then you're not telling lies. You're not hyping anything. You're actually redoing your verification and all of that. So yeah. my, my big, big, uh, uh, my big um, advice is do not report what you don't understand. And at this point in moment, you really need to understand what you're reporting on in order to feel 
because that's going to help your own resilience, but you're, it's also going to help the resilience of people out there. People will feel better if they understand in which way they're living, in which, way, in which world they're living. L let me add something to that. Um, this is a very good time, whatever country you're in, for investigative reporters in particular, to develop some sources, to have some background conversations with public health experts, infectious disease experts, people at your local universities who can guide you through some of the, the, the academic literature. You know, I've called a couple of infectious disease docs I know up and said, how do I how do I know which of these papers is important? Help me, can you walk through this, the research with me a little bit? What, what, what's going to play out locally here? Um, this is a good time to have those kind of conversations in an ongoing way. And I agree very much with Maria Teresa about looking at the science. I've made myself feel better by, by looking at um, papers in the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine and other English language um, science publications on the latest research. And sometimes I have to go to a colleague and say, I don't understand this paper, or how do I know whether this is a good one or not? You know, but if you, you know, people who are doing peer reviewed publication in scientific research journals on public health are bringing important perspectives, understanding their methods, saying to an infectious disease professor at your local medical school, what's the research method that has led to these recommendations can also help you as a reporter, A, come up with some new methodologies for yourself, and B, come up with some measures for accountability for public officials. This whole international discussion about whether to wear masks or not is partly an argument about research methodologies if you understand that, then you can talk in a more intelligent way to your public officials and write more better stories about the decisions they are making. And also, Bruce, Bruce, uh, regarding the, related to, to the decisions, to the public decisions in terms of the who, who is being quarantined, there are countries like Sweden which have not quarantined people and they're doing okay, or people like in Singapore the same and this and that. So. Do you have all the information? Does your government, does your government know who is putting out the information so that you can actually know why they're making the decisions? So it's not just about our government is right or wrong, it's about what kinds of criteria are they going into to, to make those decisions. And I think that's a super key point because it will help people cope also and understand in our countries we have a huge social impact because of the quarantine. I don't know if the remedy and the quarantine as a remedy is, is, is gonna end up being worse for people than the actual uh, pandemic in terms of our countries where there's no social networks whatsoever. Yeah. So I think that um, in order to, to, to explain that, we need to do a lot of reporting, not just on science, as you said, Bruce, but also on, uh, on medical issues, but also on how does the government spend their money? How are yeah. they, you know, and social impact, what's happening to families? So one yeah. of the best stories come out from our own experience, people who were asking, how am I do, do, doing my job and at the same time having my kids at home and da, da, da. So look at domestic violence, for example, in some countries in Latin America is already spiking because people are forced to be all day long inside the house. So that's, a good, a good story. So yeah. I think and, and this, and this, and this suggests one other thing that I wanted to pass on from uh, my conversation yesterday with Aaron Glantz of Reveal. He talked about the importance for investigative journalists now of leaning into what you already know. So you're not going to become the world's greatest pandemic expert, but if you are already someone who is writing about, let's say, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, or gender issues, if you're someone who's already writing about aging, yes, absolutely. or if you're, if you're someone who is writing about crime, whatever, whatever the beat is, you lean into that and go back to your sources, your regular sources, and say, how is coronavirus changing your situation? What should I be writing about? They, they are going to be much more forthcoming. 
Yes, um, that's, so, so that's on, really on good points. That's also sorry, and sure. just that's a great a great idea for for freelancers to for pitching. Yeah. Yes, I think absolutely. They, can, they are experts on different subjects, but somehow connecting to the situation in a broader way, they might be able to come up with really original stories. Yeah. There's so many more questions coming in, but we're um, the clock is uh, running down, I'm afraid. And um, I just do feel that we should um, answer one question that we mentioned that hasn't been answered yet, which is this, uh, which is something that a lot of people listening will be facing, how to protect children at home, mm -hmm. um, because that question was asked. So I'm afraid we're probably going to have to end on this one. Um, and uh, I apologize for that. But I think, Bruce, if you could just end on that question. Thanks. Um it's a crucial one again some structure and planning and you know thinking about how to not bring your children into your work life is going to be important but also the national child traumatic stress network in the u.s nctsn i think and i think the international society for traumatic stress studies isdss have both posted tip sheets on talking to your children about coronavirus and there are similar Resources, resources in other languages in other countries i that's one where i would turn to the public health and and psychological professionals who are advising families on how to talk to children and then think about the journalist specific situation explaining what you can about your work and you know managing it like that but have a strategy i think that's the main thing well, thank you very much. There's been very many other questions. Uh, people have noted how the responsibility of media managers to look after their staff and many, many other things. It's a, such a rich topic. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. So uh, do keep in touch with us. We've got plenty of resources on our website. We're doing other webinars. Um, and it's absolutely great to have had everyone here today. Uh, I want to thank the audience for, for participating and also uh, to our, my colleagues at GIJN for their support. And most of all, I'd like to thank the two speakers who were really wonderful. I'm sure you will all agree, Bruce Shapiro and Maria Teresa Ronderos. Thank you both very much. We hope to have you back soon. And uh, again, to the audience, thanks very much.